Hello, my name is Martin Jakeman and welcome to Creating with Costumes and Resurrecting Recipes. This is a short and informal talk for Heritage Open Days 2021 and is produced by Historical Hazards. Now, I have the privilege of saying that my job is my passion and my passion is my job because I am a costume interpreter at the National Museum of the Royal Navy where I get to bring to life the Victorian era every single day. I've managed to clock up over 3,000 hours now of pretending to be people from other eras and with time ticking on the hours are just going up and up and I'm loving every single minute of it. I'm also the artistic director at my theatre company Historical Hazards where we bring history to life in fun, creative and inclusive ways and I've been lucky enough to say that well we've been all the way up and down the country really into different museums, theatres and schools running workshops, demonstrations, even hosting sea shanty singing days. Um, We've worked with the Army Flying Museum, the National Museum of the Royal Navy, uh, the Heritage Open Days, uh, many, many more. And there's never a dull moment. Creating in what I call performative heritage is such a fun and exciting, uh, thriving atmosphere. There's always challenges, yes, but there's always ways of overcoming them and trying to adapt and create in new ways. And that is what, oh, that's what I love to do. Now, quite a lot of you are going to be thinking, creating with costume. That sounds like just performance. Well, you're right. But within the heritage sector, there's a term that we tend to use called costumed interpretation. And it is different to regular performance that you will find on stage. And we'll go through that a little bit later on. But the first question is, what is costumed interpretation? People will ask, is it acting? Is it teaching? Is it a a tour guide in costume? Or is it LARP, this live action role play? And it's a really tricky one to define because there's so many different styles out there that there's not really a main one to follow. So depending on who you ask or what property you go to, uh, what foundation you're going along to see uh, perform or to reenact, we'll give you a different answer. So the one that I tend to use is performative heritage, which I have coined the term of. And for me, it is all about fun, accessibility and accidental learning. Now, what I mean by accidental learning is that you are having so much fun that you go away at the end and you go, oh, you know what? I've learned quite a bit today. So it's not this formal way of learning, of sitting down, listening to a lecture. Yes, there can be serious notes uh, because really you want that contrast between fun and serious points that you need to cover throughout history. But overall, you should go away feeling not only that you've been entertained, but also that you've learned something. And I think that's the key thing. You can learn so much more if you're having a good time. So here we have the two main approaches. You have live interpretation and you have living history. This is being taken from the talk Museum and Heritage Interpretation, Living History versus Live Interpretation. And you can find this video on YouTube. It's an extremely interesting video, so it raises some great points. If you want to go away and watch it afterwards, I thoroughly suggest doing so. Let's first look at live interpretation. Now, it tends to be theatrical. There's that heightened element that the audience are there and they're going to watch something happen. Now, they can either do that in a passive or an active way, meaning they can either just stand there and watch or they can get involved. Costumes are warm. There's that element of when you are watching a spectacle happen in front of you with live interpretation... That costume or that period dress, depending on uh, who you ask, breaks the reality of the modern day. And in a sense, you are traveling back in time. Now, the activity or the performance is then done in either first or third person. And the simplest way I can explain this is if you're a Victorian 
and somebody has their phone out, in first person, you would not know what that phone is. You've never heard of a mobile phone before. Whereas if you were performing it in third person, you'd be able to look at it and go, well, you know, back in the Victorian era, we didn't have mobile phones. So that's a really the simplest way I can explain it to you. Now, the main focus is entertainment. You're going along, you're going to watch something happen, you're going to be entertained by it, but perhaps there's not as heavy leaning on education. And the fact that it's immersive, like, again, what we're looking for is that the audience are going to have this break from reality. There's something happening in front of them that will, in some form, transport them back in time to that era. And now living history. So, tends to be non-theatrical. It doesn't have that same heightened performance sense as the live interpretation. It is, as you'll be able to see down the bottom, presentation based. It can still be energetic, but it's not in that performance sense. Now, the audiences are mainly passive. They're there to watch. They're there to learn something. They're not there to take part. And costumes may be worn, but only really as a sense of a demonstration. So you, the person giving the presentation, is more of just a mannequin. These are the clothes that the person might have worn, or these are the clothes that the person did wear. They are not your clothes, because you are not the character. And that, then again, links with the, the demonstration in third person. So again, it's not you. You are merely showing what they did. And the main focus is education. And I'm not saying at all that because it's educational, it can't be fun and engaging. It absolutely can be and absolutely should be. But the main focus is on learning something, not just for fun or to pass the time. And it is presentation based. This works best if you are demonstrating how to do something or how things were done. Now, costumed interpreting has been around for quite a while. Here's its timeline. So actually, the first sort of record of costumed interpreting is all the way back in 1865, when Americans were reenacting some of the wars in which they had seen. To come over to Britain, you're then looking at around the 1970s. And Blist Hill, which is a fantastic site and has been featured on many BBC documentaries, especially with Ruth Goodman, they have ad hoc interpretations. So it begins to, you've sort of got it in its novelty stage. Then what, five years later, costumed interpretation starts at the Black Country uh, Museum, which is now the Black Country Living Museum. 1985, Daily costumed interpreting at Beamish, another site. So all of a sudden you've gone from ad hoc in 1973 up in Bliss Hill to now it happening daily. It draws people in. But in 1994, Beamish Museum replaces the theatre company that is supplying its interpretation. So you've gone from this theatrical group that are supplying with now an in-house group. Personally, I don't, I can't speak of whether the theatrical side stepped down on that changeover, but I just thought it was an interesting point in the costume interpretation timeline that actually a theatre company stepped down and it became in-house. In 1998, we have a book called Past Into the Present by Stacey F. Roth. Now, this looked at quite some detail the difference between first and third person interpretation and it came across where the third person interpretation was sort of looked down on it's it's an easy way out which it very much isn't uh, but in this sort of era you've got that split between first and third person interpretation I think personally that at this point you're looking at the idea of putting something scholarly. You have to justify what costume interpretation is with this scholarly ideas. And I personally don't think you do. I mean, when I was lecturing it at the University of Winchester, at no point did I think, let's put it up on a pedestal. It is what it is. 
people might choose to dress up. We engage with the audience, they learn things, and hopefully they have a good amount of fun on the way. But with that in mind, in 2007, we then have Borrowed Robes, which is a short article on costumes interpretation, not just in the United Kingdom, but also in the United States as well. I found this eye-opening because there were so many interviews uh, that people have been asked uh, as they visited. And the biggest downfall for the costumes interpreters was that it wasn't entertaining. And so that's why, for my personal style of the performative heritage, it needs to be entertaining. Because, yes, you can have all these facts and figures and people can and learn, and that's fantastic. For some people, that's what they want. But especially for the youngsters and those that have gone for a fun day out rather than, in their heads, to go and learn about something, this playful element keeps their mind open more like a sponge for longer and I find that you can then hear children talking about something that you've you've mentioned in passing so for example on HMS Warrior I mention about a broad arrow on a ship's biscuit now, if I was to sit a child down and say I'm going to tell you how we bake biscuits on board I mean a lot of them would probably be like nah you're all right but you bang the biscuit on the table and you say look have you ever had a biscuit like that and all of a sudden it's a a question for them, they're engaged, and just in passing, I maybe talk about this arrow on the biscuit for 10, 15 seconds, but quite a lot of the time, they'll then go around the ship, and they'll notice the other arrows in which we have around, and they go, it's just like the one on the biscuit, so it's fantastic of what people will pick up, these small details, if you keep it light, jovial, and open. And speaking of HMS Warrior, in 2019, she became a live interpretation ship. There was a large injection of funds from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and other funders. And compartments were opened up. And part of that, we have four full-time costumed interpreters on board. And I'm lucky enough to be one of them. I take on the role of Lieutenant Jackie Fisher. Now, being the Victorian era and the Royal Navy and ships, there is normally, of course, no women allowed on board the ships. So, this specific date in 1863 has been chosen because Warrior went on a round Britain cruise and 1% of the United Kingdom's population came on board to view where all the taxpayers' money had gone. So, part of our day-to-day -day life is, strangely enough, answering questions of why women are in fact allowed on board. And there's ample people that you can meet. So there is Lieutenant Fisher, who's in charge of the ship in the captain's current absence as officer of the watch. You have Midshipman Murray, who is an officer in training. You have able seaman Richard Pollard, who's sort of your standard Cornish cheeky chappy sort of sailor. You have an engineer who goes around and he's an interesting chap because socially he doesn't quite fit in uh, because he's not a part technically of the Royal Navy. He's a civil branch and there's a lot of friction between the Royal Navy and that engineering and stoker side. Now, you then have our well, my favourite character, which is Mr. Tamlin. He's the stoker on board. He's down in the boiler room, almost 23 foot below the water line and Fisher and Tamlin so you have that that upper class officer and you have the working class stoker that contrast so beautifully together especially when we had a one-way system on board so now thinking about costume Fisher has a beautiful tailored costume. It has gold ribbon. It has gold buttons, a sword on the side, a wonderful cap, a big old Victorian bow tie. He looks grand. He's slightly suave. He's cheeky. He's standoffish uh, if children are misbehaving. And he gives this great sort of feel of how wonderful it is to be in Victorian Britain. Well, the next then W, I suppose, is where. And there are loads of places around. So we're looking within the Hampshire area first and then the wider country because this is for the Winchester Heritage Open Days. So the first one is Milestones in Basingstoke. 
fantastic museum with loads of houses and uh, buildings that have been brought into this specially made sort of hangar, as it were, and rebuilt. And you can walk around old Basingstoke uh, going into shops. You can see uh, shop fronts and they have, a, I believe it's a Second World War working sweet shop where you can go and change your your tuppence and your ration card for some World War Two style sweeties. Of course, you have HMS Warrior down in Portsmouth. Um, I dare say it's my favourite, but I am a little bit biased. The Wildon Downland Museum over in Chichester, uh, which I'm lucky enough actually to go and do some sea shanties over there uh, with them later on this year. So I'm looking forward to that. But that's another uh, sort of custom uh, site where buildings have been taken down brick by brick and then remade brick by brick on this site and it covers a massive amount of area i remember going and i was absolutely knackered by the end of the first day um just because all of the walking there's so much to take in but it really is awe inspiring now uh, the black country living museum i have been to and it is a wonderful wonderful mixture of different eras and you find yourself walking from uh you've got uh what 1940s 50s 60s uh you've got the edwardian the victorian and they do have costumed interpreters there and i went along to an edwardian school session if you want to see how TikTok, social media and costumed interpreters and, and museum or heritage sites can work really, really effectively. Check them out on TikTok. It is fantastic. I follow them and whenever they upload a video, I know that I'm going to be smiling and laughing because they're just there's just something about them that they've managed to just get so spot on and perfect with this TikTok idea of these short videos it, it truly is wonderful i'm fangirling a little bit but please go and check them out uh warwick castle i have been to and this is a really interesting one because it's run by merlin so you have that real heavy emphasis on entertainment but actually you can learn quite a bit when you go around because you've got the main castle itself and that's slightly more traditional in the sense of that there's mannequins and you go around there's the different eras of the castle but then you've got uh, the dungeons there as well, which are much like the London dungeons. Again, that's run by Merlin. Um, and then you've got the wider grounds and there's a falcon show, uh, bird shows and whatnot. And again, you just find yourself semi-immersed that they're in costume and you can so you can have a go with archery as well, I think. And I think it's just the idea of being able to walk around these fantastic grounds and they've dressed everything up beautifully, uh, the shops and whatnot, they look like tents. Um, and again, it just mind-blowing the way that they've managed to set it up, and I think it works really well. Next, we have two special mentions. These are places that I am yet to visit, but I have heard nothing but fantastic things about. The first is called Little Woodham, and that's down my neck of the woods uh, in Gosport. And it's a lovely little 17th century um, immersive place. Um, again, I haven't been, so I can't really tell you much about it. But um, from what I've heard from other historian friends and people that have visited, it's a really, really wonderful experience to have. And it is extremely immersive. So once I've been, I can then let you all know uh, in one way or another. You can follow me on Instagram if you want, which is Martin's Heritage World. Uh, shameless plug there, but you have to do these things, really, don't you? And the other one is Hampton Court Palace. Now, Hampton Court Palace, their costumed interpreters are run by past pleasures. And they are with the expression, the big boys, when it comes to costumed interpretation. To me, they are the company, and they've been supplying places up and down the country for years, and they have got Hampton Court Palace. And they've got different queens that arrived, they've got Henry VIII, and again, I want to go and I want to experience it, because with what I've heard from friends, they've always gone when they're younger, and so they have sort of a child's experience. And of course, they're saying, well, Henry VIII was rather scary. 
but um, I can't wait to go and experience it as not just an adult, but also somebody who works in the heritage sector, just to see what sort of style uh, they have. Um, so yes, there you go. We've got two special mentions, and hopefully by next year, if I do another talk for the Heritage Open Days, they can go on to the list in which I have visited. So there you go. And now, you will be pleased to hear that you don't just have to listen. This is time where we turn to the active part. You're going to become the active audience member now because I have a task for you. We're going to start looking at how to create now with the costumes and how to resurrect the recipes. So your first task is this. I'd like you to write down these questions and then go make yourself a cup of tea, answering them as you go. It's that simple. So give the video a pause and go make yourself a cup of tea. Go on, off you go. Well, welcome back. Uh, I hope you've had uh, a good time doing the task. And even if you didn't, well, it's all right, because now you've got yourself a cup of tea. Well, hey. Um, so, right, let's have a look. So we've got these questions. So where did you get the water from? Most of you are going to say a tap. How did you heat the water? In a kettle, of course. And what tea did you use? Now, this is where we can get a little bit fancy because some of you might say, well, I'm having green tea. Some of you might say, well, I'm having black tea. Um, but the main thing that I like to highlight with this question is it's going to be loose leaf tea. The, the main thing is that you have had a tea bag uh, that you've made your tea with. Now, again, some of you might be fancy. Some of you might still use loose leaf tea. And then that, when addressing with a group, of course, would then separate you out. Not in a bad way, of course, but just saying that sort of even in the modern day, these things still happen. What milk did you use? Now, I've put blue, green or red just because they're the top three. But of course, you have loads of different types of milk as well. Did you put the milk or did you put the tea in first? This can cause a lot of arguments. I've run this session, uh, as I said, at the University of Winchester. Uh, I've done it at some drama groups as well. And even kids at around the age of sort of 10 uh, up to 12, they still argue with each other about whether you should put the milk or the tea in first. And then what mug do you have it in? Is it your favourite mug? What's your mug made of? What colour is the mug? Um... And now that we've answered those questions, we can start looking at contrasting. Because the wonderful thing about tea is it's sort of timeless. Like, yes, when it first came over, it was mainly uh, green tea. But sort of since the mid to late Victorian era, the idea of a cup of tea is British. And so being able to contrast the modern concept of a cup of tea and the old concepts of the cup of tea are just, to me, one of the easiest ways that you can show how times have changed. So in this context, we're looking at the First World War soldier. And now we're get, he's, in a way, is going to answer the questions. So where did he get the water from? A petrol can. Oh yes, fresh water on the front line isn't really a thing. Uh, so petrol cans were used, old ones. And there was a running joke that you'd be able to tell whether the, the water that you're drinking has come out of either a shell or a BP petrol can how did you heat the water well for them it's in a mess tin some people might have kettles but the vast majority again a mess tin over a small little stove it might be some ripped up sandbag that's draped in paraffin and set a light to but it's not the modern day kettle where you've just flicked it on or you've put it on a gas ring what tea do you use well it's a loose leaf tea and what milk did you use condensed now, some children at this point would go, never heard of that. And if they're with their parents or their grandparents, then most of them go, oh, yeah, I remember condensed milk. Oh, yeah, we used to have it on toast. Oh, yeah. Oh, I still have it in my tea. It can be a really good uh, sort of conversation point starting off because different generations remember it in different ways. And if you're running a session, I would say always factor in chit-chat time because you don't want to sort of close people down if intergenerational conversations have piped up it's a truly wonderful thing to have happen in a session so give it the time that's needed obviously yes don't let it go on for hours on end but just to allow that moment and cherish that moment and then move on so did you put the milk or the tea in first well for them it's the tea so you put in your loose leaf tea 
you then pour in your hot water i say hot it might not be boiling and then your condensed milk in it goes and there's no tea strainers luckily when the tea leaves begin to swell they'll then slowly sink to the bottom and then what mug did you have metal they're these little metal uh, mugs uh, tend to have them enamel paint on it they had pint mugs normally in uh, in the first world war on the trenches so they were they were big they heat up really quick if you've ever drunk something from an enamel mug or oh, do they heat up fast but then the tea or the contents cools down very quickly so uh, you definitely have to try and strike the balance now task 1b is sort of an added extra i'd really suggest of course doing it but if you don't have the ingredients it can wait until you do and we're going to be looking at the trench cake now the trench cake made at home and sent out to the boys on the front lines these ideas of comforts from home and a trench cake as we're looking at the recipe so if you go onto the website historical as ours and then click on uh, that link below that says uh, the recipe up it pops and we've only got two teaspoons of cocoa and of course in a modern day cake if you're going to do a chocolate cake you make it really really chocolatey but it's not it's just subtly chocolatey um, and actually it's not really a sponge it's more of a biscuit biscuity cake because you've got that uh, sort of flour that you're crumbling together and you're mixing it in with the cocoa and you've got the, your bicarbonate of soda and your, your vinegar that is going to help it rise. Um, but when you eat it, there is a, a crunch about it. And again, it's really sort of fascinating to see the difference between a cake then, what they are eating. And if you were to put that in front of a child today what they would make of it um i mean the fruit and the spices really add to it especially the ginger and the nutmeg but of course the main thing that's missing are eggs eggs of course being one of like the big things in a cake strangely enough especially when everyone thinks of like the victoria sponge uh give it a bake again it's a long baking time when you look at it as well i tend to not go for the full time uh, keep checking in on it uh, because it will turn dark rather quickly and it'll just snap and all of a sudden you're like ah oh, now i've got an overdone cake so make your tea have a slice of cake and then make some notes i know it sounds weird making notes about tea and cake but it will then help you for the final task where you're going to write a letter from the front line back home to your family and letters home are a fantastic way of highlighting the differences in the two places because you are quite literally contrasting the two and saying how different it is. So looking at your notes from 1A when you made that cup of tea and 1B when you then have tried the cake, hopefully you have done 1B, if not, do not worry, and just write to your parents or you could have a best friend or an auntie maybe and just say what life is like out in the trenches with all of the tea and all of the cake now because obviously the, we're also looking at costume or uh, these ideas of uniform and how you can create with that we're going to begin to mix it in so looking at the chap here on the right hand side of the screen he's in his battle dress he has a very itchy tunic it is very coarse and <laughs> actually around 97 percent of everyone on the front line had lice so there's going to be a lot of scratching involved especially in the seams where they like to lay their eggs i know rather grim now that you've just had a cup of tea so a slice of cake i do apologize um now what he's wearing he's also got um an, an awful lot of uh, webbing on now within those pockets he's having to carry 150 rounds of ammunition as well as all of his rations his helmet it's going to be knackered and it's so heavy and it's going to pull down on your shoulders. So again, maybe you're going to mention how tired you are. And how so, so itchy all of these bites are. But, you know, that slice of cake has really helped me sort of just t distract me from all of these woes of trench life. 
You might mention that, please, could you possibly send another pair of socks? Because I think it was only about a week that a pair of socks would last because the men did so much marching. And of course, if your boots got wet, then of course they would rot and so would your feet. Um, But there had to be a specific pattern. You don't want a a sock with a seam in it. So actually the, the, the Red Cross and other charities used to put out in newspapers patterns to knit socks that didn't have a seam. And so you might want to just mention, could you possibly send some socks? That would be rather nice. Uh, other things you could ask for, might want to send some jam, uh, because making jam at home, sending it over, it makes the biscuits they had, which is almost just as bad as a ship's biscuit. They were made by Huntley and Palmer's, probably the worst biscuit they ever made. It would make them slightly more palatable. Um, or maybe just another photograph. Maybe you've lost the photograph that the family sent you, and I know they're expensive, but could I just have another one? Or perhaps tell them, that you've taken one of those Huntley and Palmer's biscuits and you've made it into a photo frame because, again, that's something they did. So we're looking at history with a little H, as it were. You've got history with a big H, which is things like the events and the wider context. So that's the macro. But for this exercise, we're going to look at the micro. So give that a go. There's no right or wrong way of doing it, really. It's your personal letter. And then that sort of comes to the end of the talk, really. Um, We've gone through what costume interpretation is, what we can interpret, where it's happening, sort of why we're doing it. And then looking at food and the drink elements. So some might call that domestic interpretation and how that can link in and really help support uh, this idea of bringing history to life. And if I get only one thing across to you, that is, don't forget about enjoyment. If they're going to enjoy themselves, they're going to learn so much more. And that, again, don't worry if you have to put a solemn or a a really sort of heartfelt moment in there. Absolutely fine. Take that moment. But remember to bring it back up again so you're leaving on a positive note so they can go away and they're feeling positive about what they've just seen. So, my name is Martin Jakeman. I'm a costumed interpreter at the National Museum of the Royal Navy on board HMS Warrior and I'm the Artistic Director of Historical Hazards. So if you want any more information, feel free to head to the Historical Hazards website, drop me an email, I'll happily answer any questions you have. Thank you very much to the Heritage Open Days 2021 for having me. And finally, thank you to my dear friend and colleague, Emma Cornell Stoffer, who has been an absolute star, helping me with the supporting notes and research for the food and drink side of this talk. Uh, I've done projects with her before, and she really is a remarkable woman. And hopefully in the next coming years, uh, we're going to be working more together. So once again, keep your eyes peeled on social media. All that's left to say is thank you very much for stopping by and listening. And I hope you enjoy not only the online content for the Heritage Open Days, but also try and get yourself to some in-person events. There's so many great, great events happening this year, as there is every year, really. So thank you very much and goodbye.